Well, we are beginning a new series in the book of Genesis this morning that I'm very excited about. We're going to spend eight weeks in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. The title of the message this morning is In the Beginning. We're going to be looking at Genesis 1-1 through chapter 2, verse 3. What I would like to do is I would like to Pray now, and then we will open Genesis 1 and look at it together. So, let's, let's pray. Father, Lord, we, we do love you and adore you. And Lord, it is the desire of our hearts, when we are thinking right, that you would glorify your name. Father, I pray that today in this place you would glorify your name and teach us that the glory of your name, is the most fulfilling thing we could ever experience. Your glory, your presence. Lord, I pray that you'd help me now to be faithful to your word. And I pray that you'd give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you have for us today. In the precious name of Jesus, we say and pray. Amen. Genesis 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place And let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruits, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind, on the earth, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and Let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man after, in our own image, after our likeness, and Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his 
own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heaven, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished all his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Friends, this is the word of our God. All God's people say, Amen. Amen. And may he add his blessings to the reading of it, of it. In the beginning, God. The first sentence, indeed the first three words of the Bible give us an explanation for the existence of all things. And not only that, the first sentence in the Bible gives us a hint at where everything is headed. Romans 11.36 says, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. The very first sentence in the Bible tells us that the, the Bible is not primarily a book about us. First and foremost, the Bible is about the God who made us, who He is, and what He has done. I'm just going to tell you, believer, and, and if you're not a believer yet, I hope that you soon will be, but if you try to make take the Bible and make it be all about you and what you must do, Verses, seeing it through the lens of it is about God and what he has done for us. And now what does that mean? How do I live in response to that? You are going to plant a lot of difficulty in your Christian walk and have a lot of frustration. Creation is not an expression in any way whatsoever of any lack, any God. The Bible says from everlasting to everlasting, he has been God. From eternity, before time, before space and matter began, God was there. God lived in infinite joy and happiness and peace and glory within the community of the Trinity. Sometimes in our ignorance, we we think maybe God was lonely, but God was not lonely or bored. He had everything he ever needed before we got here to be happy forever within himself. So so in creation, this is not an expression of of any need God had or any lack within the Trinity. It is an expression of the overflow. The willingness of our God to share His glory. To make the circle bigger. The fellowship of the joy and glory of the Trinity. He wanted to make that bigger. This morning, as we come to the creation account, I want us to take a look at it through three lenses. Okay? Are you ready? Number one, the historical lens. Number two, don't be too worried about these big words. I'll tell you what they mean. The theological lens. And number three, the doxological lens. All right? The historical, the theological, and then the doxological. Are you all ready? 
Number one, the historical lens. Frequently, and man, this is in our day, uh, science is pitted against Christianity. It's, and and we, we're sold this false narrative of you can either believe in the Bible's account of everything, uh, you, you can believe the Bible's account of creation, or you can believe in science. But I want to tell you, I want you to have great confidence in this believer that, that in reality, there is zero um, uh, Christian, biblical Christianity and true science have zero problems with each other. Zero. Um, here's what you run into. You, uh, you don't have to wait to college. Of course, you get this in high school if you go to a public school. But um, you say you graduate high school, you go off to college, and you get there, and people who may be smarter than you, more highly educated than you, uh, they tell you that, hey, the vast majority of scientists hold to the theory of evolution as the explanation for how everything got here. Here's what they don't tell you. They don't tell you that the vast majority of scientists have not independently, personally, examined all of the evidence on their own and then come to the conclusion that the universe is here because of evolution. The vast majority of scientists rarely look at much of the evidence at all. They simply, by faith, believe what their professors teach and what other scientists claim to teach. And so they enter their field just accepting that by faith. This is something very important for you to understand. I want you to spend some time thinking about this. Everyone comes to the scientific evidence for an explanation of, of everything in the world around them. Everybody comes to it with presuppositions. Now, I know that might be a big word, but a presupposition is just something you believe already before you even begin to look at the evidence. So an atheist comes to the scientific evidence and their presupposition before they look at science is that there is no God and that there is a natural explanation for everything. Now, if you're, I, I want to freely admit, it's full transparency, I am a Christian, and I have presuppositions as well. I believe that there is a God, a supernatural, uh, transcendent, all-powerful, all-wise God, and I believe that He has communicated to us accurately, truthfully, and faithfully through His Word. Okay, so we're all biased. Let's just be honest up front about what our biases are. But if you start out with a fundamental belief that there is no God and everything must have a natural explanation, then you can't come to the scientific evidence and conclude that everything got here by creation. Your presuppositions won't allow it. Both evolutionists and creationists. You know what's funny? Um, evolutionary scientists, creation scientists, they're brilliant people on both sides, no doubt. People ten times twice as smart as me. And maybe even all of us put together. But on both sides, they, they look at the exact same evidence and draw completely opposite conclusions. Why? because of their presuppositions. But here's the thing, both sides base their conclusions on faith. Things they can't prove in a lab. As Christians, we have faith in a wise and powerful God. Atheists place their faith in chance accident.
friends, Darwinian evolution, even to modern scientists, there's a movement going on right now in, in modern science. There is a major movement, even among secular scientists. Uh, Darwinian, Darwinian evolution is becoming less and less a viable explanation for the development of life on our planet. Dar Darwinism can do a good job of explaining to us why there are different sizes of cats. Indeed, we do uh, believe that microevolution is demonstrable by science. Um, you can see why there are different breeds of dogs and wolves and coyotes. You can see um, why birds are different shapes in different parts of the world and have different shaped beaks depending on where they live. Yeah, they, um, animal life life adapts to its environment, but there, there is no evidence of one species of anything developing into the species of something else. There's no evidence for this. Not to mention that, y'all. And, and thankfully, most, most of them are pretty honest about this. Um, atheistic scientists admit that Darwinian evolution gives zero explanation on how Everything has come to be out of nothing. There's pretty much consensus that the universe had to have had a beginning. Sci uh, atheists and Christian scientists pretty much agree on that. But Darwinian evolution says, hey, listen, I, I, I mean, I know mutations are bad 99.9% .9 of the time, but hey, um, Somehow, everything just kept mutating and getting better for millions and millions of years, and now we have human life. Um, but the other thing that Darwinian evolution can give zero explanation of, zero, is how life came into being in the first place. How something inanimate came to be biologically alive. And that's why even many secular scientists are starting to say, hey, you know, Darwinism can help us with some things, but it can't really tell us how life has come to be where it's at. Let me give you three simple reasons why I believe the Genesis account of a six-day creation and that this belief is historically reliable. Number one, the Bible presents the six-day creation account as historical. Christianity views the Bible not merely as a collection of religious writings, but as the Word of God. When we read Genesis chapter 1 and all these chapters of Genesis, we believe what 2 Timothy 3.16 says, that all Scripture is breathed out by God. And so our position is that the Genesis account is God's revelation of Himself and His own work as Creator in history. The straightforward claim of Genesis is that God created the heavens and the earth in six days. Now, I'm not going to tell you, and I'd be careful about this because we can shoot our own selves in the foot, I'm not going to tell you that Genesis 1 through 3 doesn't have um, poetry in it or symbolism. But even if it does, it's, it's pretending to relate to us historical facts about the origin of the universe. So as believers, we accept the early chapters of Genesis as the Word of God and therefore to be a trustworthy, accurate account of the origin of the universe. That's number one. Number two, biblical writers hundreds and even thousands of years after these early chapters of Genesis um, viewed the six-day uh, creation account as historical. 2,500 years, roughly, after Adam and Eve would have sinned in the garden, I want you to listen to Moses, as he validates 
the historicity of the sixth day of creation account. You could say, well, Genesis 1, this is this symbolic. It's poetry. It's a song. Okay. But Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Just Exodus is not poetry. <laughs> it's history. It's people talking in history about their belief about the origin of the universe and the six-day creation account being a historical event. Now, number three, to me, to me, this one's most compelling. Okay? This one's most compelling. Jesus viewed the Genesis account as historical. Matthew chapter 19, verse 4 through 6, Jesus answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Jesus' argument on what marriage is is based on his belief in the historical nature of of the creation account. Also, incidentally, I, I welcome you to investigate this for yourself, but Jesus also referred to the death of Abel, the murder of Abel in Genesis chapter 4, the flood in Genesis chapter 6, as well as the life of Abraham as historical events and historical figures. So, my argument is simply this, the creation account in Genesis should be accepted as historical because the scripture presents it as historically accurate and because Jesus himself viewed it as historical. Now, y'all, well, be real for just a minute. I mean, can you imagine for most of it, now that there's a couple of you, like I can think of one or two of you who might enjoy this. But can you imagine sitting in a college university class being the only person there that believed the creation account of the Bible? Probably the last thing you want to do is let everybody know. You don't want to be thought of as ignorant and a fool. You don't want to suffer that embarrassment. We all have that feeling, but I want you to listen to me. The majority of the world Everybody outside of Christ is spiritually blind. Don't be ashamed to believe what God has said in His Word so that we don't look ignorant in the eyes of people who are lost and spiritually blind. Number two. Number one is the historical lens. Number two is the theological lens. Um, when I use the word theology, I don't want you to feel intimidated or bored. Why? Because when I, when I use the word theology, I, I don't have pictured sitting in a classroom listening and thinking about really complicated things. When I use the word theology, I'm talking about knowing. And knowing intimately the true and living God. I'm talk talking about knowing Him personally in a life-changing way. I'm talking about seeing Him and knowing His power and His love. So when I use the word theology, that's what I'm thinking about. Knowing the power of God personally in your life. When the Bible starts out, in the beginning, God. God is not only um, telling us about the origin of the universe, but He is beginning to tell us a story that is going to culminate in what? The new heavens and the new earth. This is, this is the beginning. written over more than 30 different authors over a 1,500-year period. But the Bible is a unified story telling us 
uh, about this ultimate event of the of this 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 a story that climaxes at the cross of Christ as the display of God's power, glory, and love. The great What this means is, beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and every verse thereafter, every sentence in the Old Testament, every story, every character, every event is leading us to Christ and His salvation for His people through the cross. One thing Genesis begins to introduce us to in chapter 1 is the Trinity. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity is that God exists as one being, one God who exists in three persons, three in one, one in three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, equal in glory, majesty, and power. Look at verse 1. This is exciting. I'm about to get a little excited, and you should too. I hope you do too. Verse 1, in the beginning... God. Let's just assume, will you just assume with me for argument's sake that God the Father is there? Okay? Let's just assume God the Father, the true and living God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then look at verse 2. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. That word here, all right, now we're thinking God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. That word hovering over the face of the deep, that is a picture, I I think some versions even say was brooding over the deep. The picture there is that word hovering, that word brooding is like a mother bird will do over her baby birds when she is fanning them with her wings, trying to to arouse them, to, to wake them up. Here we have the Holy Spirit Hovering over, rooting over creation, bringing order out of chaos. Now, you get down to verse 26 and you see something very interesting when he talks about making man. God said, let us, what? What just happened there? It's one God. Why is he talking about himself in a plural fashion, right? Right? Well, the angels uh, were were there before mankind, but the angels did not help God create. Right? Creation is an act of God. Right? This is this is a word spoken within the Trinity. Let us make man in our image. So we have God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. What about God the Son? Well, let me ask you a question. How did God create? This, you, you feel free to answer. How did God, did, did God create? He spoke and God said, let there be light. And there was light. God said, let there be. And in whatever case, when God said that, His very words spoke things that previously did not exist into existence. Now, you go, remember I'm talking about the Bible being a unified story? Watch this. Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. Are you catching on yet? Where am I going next? Somebody. Someone's got to know where I'm going next. Jesus is the word. Where do we get that from? John 1, 1, in the beginning was the, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. All things, this is Genesis 1, 2. Let's just read this. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. You can't you can never hear Genesis 1 1 in the beginning God. And now you know he was there with him. And he was him. Verse 2 He was in the beginning with God. All 
things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we see, and of course, I mean, Genesis, God knows that you and I can't handle it all at once. So he can't just unload it all on us in Genesis 1-1. But over time, we see that all along, this is what was happening. God the Father created, created the universe through the agency of his Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? I mean, the, the, the fabric of our existence is caught up in the life of the triune God. Just like uh, there really is no creation without the Trinity, there is no salvation without each member of the Trinity. Not only does Genesis begin to reveal to us who our God is, but it also it begins, and I'm saying it just begins, to reveal to us his salvation. Because, watch this, before I... Can I tell you something about salvation? I'm just looking to see how much time, because I'm in point two, and I'm a little excited about this. I don't want to keep you here all afternoon. We're making actually really good times. So don't panic. Do you know that... Do you ever have something go wrong in your life? Like, you were planning this, but something unexpected came up, a problem... And so you had to change your plans and come up. You had to either fix this thing or go around it to make your plans work. We don't need to make the mistake of thinking that God is like that. Salvation, the plan for Christ to be glorified through his death on the cross, is not, it's not as if God makes a wonderful world and holy moly, how does Satan get in here and mess everything up? Like, I, God, there's never a moment where God, God's like, I, well, I didn't see that. God's not like us. There's nothing catches him by surprise. The cross is the plan of God from before time began to maximize his glory, to display his love, his holiness, his awesomeness in the world. Before he spoke the first thing into existence. Well, how do you know that, Matt? Well, let me give you just one place. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of works, but because of his own purpose and grace. Ah, watch this. His own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus when before the ages began. The grace of salvation was God's plan given to us before the ages began. That means the fall, Adam and Eve, Satan in the garden, did not catch God by surprise. Not one bit. Just one more thing, and... and, and We'll elaborate on this a little bit more as we go along in Genesis, but I can't not read this verse from Paul's second letter to Corinthians, to the Corinthians. Second Corinthians 4, 6, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see that? See, in, in the same way, the Holy Spirit was there hovering, brooding over the raw creation, bringing, bringing it to life. So the Holy Spirit brings us from death to life. The God who said, let light shine out of darkness, shines in the heart the hearts of dead sinners 
in order to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we begin to see theologically in Genesis 1 the nature of God unfold. We, we will begin to see, beginning here in Genesis 1, as we go forward in Genesis, we will begin to see God's plan for salvation unfold. I want to look now. We've looked at number one, the historical lens. We've looked at the theological lens. I want to look at the doxological lens. I know, so I, I, I tried so hard not to use this word, but I just kept coming back to it. Um, do you guys rem remember this song? A lot of us grew up in church singing the doxology. You heard the song, the doxology? That, that's, what, that's what this word comes from. It's just an adjective. Doxology means a hymn of praise to God, a, a song of worship. It means praise to God. Doxology means to give praise to God, to give worship to God. All right? So that's what I mean by this. I want to look through this at this through the lens of worship because this is what we are created for. And, and I, I referenced this before. Some scholars think that Genesis chapter 1 could be a song or a poem. And that's because there is repetition, there's a rhythm, there's a symmetry. And I, I don't know, there, there's, scholars debate everything, but they debate this. But here's what's not in debate. Everything was created to sing God's praise. Everything. And before I'm going to, I want to prove that to you from the Bible, but I want to give you like the I want to give you the formula for how and why that works. Here it is. Number one, God speaks. Number two, when He speaks, things come into existence that that did not exist before. Number three, then God pronounces them good and places His blessings over them. And then four, everything responds back in a song of worship to him. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Psalm 65, verse 12, the pastures of the wilderness overflow, the hills gird themselves with joy, the meadows clothe themselves with flocks, the valleys deck themselves with grain. They, they shout and sing together for joy. Nehemiah 9, 6. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. From the stars, the grass, Trees, everything worships God. Everything is singing this song of praise back to God. And I mean, why, if, you, if you have been created by God, for God, and, and living under His blessing, that's the natural response is to sing back to Him. And you know, in this concept, mankind was created with a, with a special place in creation. Nothing else in all of creation has been said to be created in the image of God. Nothing else in all of creation, though it does sing God's praise, though it glorifies God, nothing else can live in the kind of intimate communion with God that we can. And so this is this is if we have been called to be the worship leaders of creation. We should be leading creation in the song of worship. But something happened. Instead of leading creation in worship, our first parents, Adam and Eve, rebelled against God and ate of the fruit of the tree and plunged themselves and all humanity into sin. And now the song made by a man's rebellion sounds more like fingernails scratching down a chalkboard. A 
and in order to restore the beauty and harmony of his creation. In order to bring us back into the rhythm and tune of this song. The creator entered his creation and the son of man, the son of God, was suspended between heaven and earth on the cross. And on the cross, that same voice that had once spoken planets, stars, rivers, and mountains into existence. He cried out in the darkness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Our maker essentially was being unmade. The creator was crucified for our transgressions all to undo this curse that has been brought about in creation because of the sins of man. All so that you and I could be brought back into harmony with the rest of creation. Genesis is the first chapter of the story of a God so wonderful and powerful that He could create a universe so awesome that it's beyond our wildest dreams. And it's the beginning of this story of a God that loved His people so much that He would go to these great lengths to rescue His people from their sins. Genesis is the historical account of our triune God and the beauty of His creation and how far He will go to redeem His people. Genesis is an invitation for you and I to join the song of all creation and worship this great God. Give Him the glory that is due His name by virtue of the fact Whether you choose to be a Christian or not, you have been created by God. And you owe Him your life, your breath. He is worthy of all that you are and all that you have. Given back up to Him in praise forever. Let's pray. Father, how we thank You, dear Lord, for such a powerful testimony of your goodness and your grace and your power. Lord, I do pray that the, the reality of the truth of your word would captivate our hearts. That Lord, through, through this first chapter in the Bible, Lord, we would begin to look through a window and just, Father, the rest of our existence Lord, give ourselves to seeing and studying and reveling in the glory and beauty of you as you have revealed yourself to us in your Son through the power of your Spirit. Father, I pray that you would help us to join in the song of creation. In Jesus' name, amen.